We're back and you're gone. You want to know about the Byzantine Empire? You want to be to read about the Romans? In the red, go to a library, take out a very old book, blow off the dust, and there you'll read about them. They're finished. This is a very unique experience for me uh, to meet the Rabbonim here tonight and the B'nai Torah here tonight. I say it's unusual because most of my work is not involved in standing in a Mokham Torah. Most of my work is devoted to being in the darkest place one could imagine, helping Jews who Rachman al-Atzlan converted to Christianity. My life is dedicated to helping every one of them get out of the church, get out of Edom, get out of the darkest place, and return back to the truth and the beauty of the Jewish faith. I've been doing this before almost any of you were born well over 40 years. Not everyone, there's a few customers here that were around. But it's been a very, very long time. It's really a very unusual experience for me to be like here, it really is. And not only to come here, but to walk through a, a Jewish community. It's not like I live in Lebanon or anything like that but just crossing the tracks and walking through Meir Sharm and seeing all the houses of learning instead of the filth that I normally see, the church and the Christian Bible and the priests that I confront. And, but when you're a doctor, you have to work in a place where there are sick people, not healthy people. You're in a very holy place. You're very fortunate. You're very fortunate to never have seen what I've witnessed that your eyes should never gaze at something so dark. But this is the nature of the last kingdom that would have Shlita over Klal Yisrael, the kingdom of Edom, Esav, the church, Christianity, that are dedicated to destroying the Jewish people. That's why the last of the Nevi'im, Sefer Malachi, he lived, he was one of three Nevi'im that lived in the beginning of Bayez Sheni. There were only three Nevi'im who lived at this Tukufa. There was Zechariah, Chagai, and Malachi. Zechariah was the Godel Hador of his generation. Zechariah was the person that people came to when they had a Shiloh. Zechariah Hanovi stood as one of the great luminaries of his time. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu have three Nevi'im at the beginning of Bayashani? Why did you need Nevi'im at this period of time? This is the Persian Empire. So the Gemara in explains that Mashiach could have come in the beginning of Bayashani, and Ezra could have triggered it. But the generation was not Zaycha. They were Goyim HaChet. They didn't come back from Bovell. They stayed in Queens. They stayed in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Only 42,360 Jews left Bovell and came to Eretz Yisrael on a promise. That was it. The rest of the Jewish people were in Bovell. They were in North Africa and Egypt. It was other waves, subsequent waves, but because potentially Mashiach could have come in the days of Ezra, and a base Hamigdosh could have been built, and in order to build a base Hamigdosh, you needed Novi. You can't build a base Hamigdosh without a Novi. You can't go in the Harabayas and build a base Hamigdosh without a Novi. So there were three Neviim ready, ready to go. Zechariah was the God Lador. There was a Shailas brought to him. In chapter 7 of the book of Zechariah, people who lived in Barapak, I mean Babylon, they had a Shiloh for him. The Shiloh was, do they have to still fast on the fast days? Now that the second base Hamidish has been built, 
So do we still have to fast on Tisha B'Av? You can imagine how much joy Zechariah had with such a question. It was such a geschmack, I'm sure for him, that he hear such a question. Do we still have to fast, Rabbi? And he got very angry. For two chapters, he got very angry. He said, do you think Hashem needs like, you to fast? That you have an empty stomach? This gives, it's for you that you're fasting. And he swims into the Messianic age. In fact, he says that, in fact, all the, all the fast days will be converted, will be transformed into festivals, into holidays in Zechariah chapter 8. May it be that this is the last Asura Batavis that we have to fast. Amen. May it be the next Asura Batavis. We will already be with Mashiach together, and this will be one of many, many festivals which all of Kal Yisrael together will celebrate. The will be tired throughout the world. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. Sefer Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. Sefer Yeshayahu, book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 9. No one will have to teach anyone about HaKadosh Baruch Hu anymore. All the outreach work will come to an end. Yirmiyoh HaKadosh V'Hator, a great prophet, the end of the first temple period, tells us that in those days when Mashiach comes, no one will have to teach about God, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. But now we are living in a bitter finster. Now we are living in a bitter darkness. And it's dangerous because we don't realize it. But as it turns out, fundamentalist Christians are targeting our people to convert them to Christianity. They're posing as rabbis. They're posing as seifrim. They're posing as someone who performs milu. They're posing as people who are Kabbalists. They look like anybody here in the room but they're really fundamentalist Christian missionaries that are trying to convert the Jews to Christianity because they believe that in order for Yashka to make a second coming, the Jews have to, Rahman's son, first be converted to Christianity. You are holding up the show. And what Esav did, he was a Tzayid B'piv. He was a hunter with his mouth. What does that mean? What is Esav doing? Altering this, our holy scriptures, changing the words of the Torah in order to make it look like it's speaking about Yashka. Could you imagine such a thing? Changing the meanings of the word. Could you imagine? This is the reason, my friends, why Christians in the United States, I'm sure many of you here are from America, where there are thousands of Christian schools. Not one of them teaches Lashon Kaddish to their students. Not one. Not one. Favas, why not? Lashon Kaddish is a very easy language. It's a very small language. There are only 8,800 words in all of Tanakh. That's it. That's all of Biblical Hebrew. But the church won't teach their parishioners Hebrew. Why? Because if little boys and little girls knew Lashon Kaddish, who are in the church, they would read the original. They wouldn't have to read these corrupt translations. And they would run out of the church. They would run for their lives if they were encouraged to read in the original. How nice on my eyes to see holy books and vast, vast, vast majority of them, but with, I think, one exception. I can see the all in Lashon Kaidish. Baruch Hashem. It's a geschmack. It's really geschmack to be in Israel in a Beis medrash and see Svarim that are just in the holy tongue. Just in the language that the Nevi'im use, Lashon Kaidish or Aramaic. We have Svarim that have Aramaic in it. Say for Daniel, Ezra has a lot of Aramaic. There's even one Aramaic word in the Torah, and so on. V'chulam. It's a big schmack for me. Because usually I'm in a dark place. Usually I have a person in front of me who's lost who misinterprets the words of our prophets of blessed memory, rips passages out of context completely, changes the meaning of words in our holy scriptures. And it's, 
it's the lecture series that I'm sure you saw me, heard me speak in, was in Dallas, I think. The 24 audio programs. I flew back and forth to Dallas for almost a half a year. And we filled the Jewish Community Center. The most of the audience there were Christians, the vast majority, when we started this 24 part series, lecture series. By the end of that, those 24 weeks, so many people in the audience, Bar Hashem de Tshuva. So many Christians in the audience became B'nai Noach. So many pastors and priests came to those lectures to show their congregants why I'm wrong. They came from all over the area and further, in places none of us ever heard of, from Palestine, Texas, believe it or not, there's such a place. The head of the Baptist church came to show his followers why Rabbi Singer is wrong. Why Rabbi Singer is a liar. The pastor, his wife, his mother-in-law, his children, a few months later, moved to Borough Park, Brooklyn, <laughs> where they all converted to the, to the Jewish faith with Rabbi Garnish, a chassidisha, a very chashiva, Geras. Baruch Hashem, they're coming home. There's a promise. The promise is that I'm going to find you, I'm going to bring you home. Do you know how many fake game there are in the world? You know how many imposter Gentiles there are in the world? I mean, could you only imagine how many Jews were forced to convert to Christianity going back dires many, many generations ago? They had children, they had daughters. They were forced to convert. They should have given their lives, but they didn't. A person has to give his life rather than become a Christian. Let's say a person says, I don't want to die, and converts. So that person is not Chayiv Misa. They, sh they did the wrong thing, but there were Jews who did and then hoped that maybe they'll change their mind in Spain and the Gezer will be rescinded. They moved on to Portugal, whatever. But they had children. They thought they would, things would move quickly. In fact, in Spain, when the Jews were expelled, that was the time of the greatest, I think the greatest parish on the Nevi'im, the Abar Benel. The Abar Benel was the head of finances of Spain. He was a giant. You can't even imagine what a giant he was. His whole parish on the Nevi'im was written in less than two months. He fled Portugal. He was born in Portugal in 1437. And in 1481, he fled Portugal because he was told that he was going to be killed. The Christians admired him greatly. And they warned him, Vayokam el a new king, you have to go. In the middle of the night, Imamish left and crossed the border into Spain. He's most well known for his time in Spain. When he came into Spain, before Fernand and Isabella Yamach Shemam hired him to run the finances, in that short kuf of time, he wrote his entire parish on the Nevi'im. It's mind-blowing. And then when 1492 came and the Gezerah came, that the Jews had to be had to be expelled, he knew about it. He was a very rich man. He was a multi-billionaire and frequently used his massive wealth to pay off Christians not to expel Jews. And he tried very hard, but he couldn't. And he was told, as Tishbev was coming in 1492, he was told that, look, we love you, Rabbi. You could stay here in Spain. You keep the Torah, keep a minion with you here in Spain. You don't have to go anywhere, and the rest will leave. It's a good deal. You could stay, your family, your vast wealth, we want you to just run the finances for us here in Spain. What's going to happen to my people? They have to go. I'll go with them. As Columbus's ships sailed, it's the exact same time, August 12, 1492, 
Everything was happening at the same time. The barber now left, voluntarily moved to Italy. And that's where he spent the rest of his life. He was Nifter in 1508. He was buried in Venice. If you could see his C in there, very famous. And it is there that he wrote all of his vast works, were written from 1492 to 1508. These are the giants that made it possible for us to understand the holy works of the prophets of blessed memory. This is just one luminary. It was very hard for him. He was tested. He was tested like Yosef, Hat Sadik. Why at Sadik? He could have walked away. What, what did I do? I, got, I worship God. I got thrown into prison for a crime I didn't commit. I'm gone. Many people would go. Many people would just give up. I'm done with my religion. He didn't. Dovid Amelech, another tzaddik. Why? Why so great? A man who's Zoycha, his name is mentioned in Tanakh more frequently than anyone else. Dovid Amelech had Cyrus in his life. He had a son who wanted to kill him. He had a father-in-law who wanted to kill him. He had a friend who betrayed him. Everyone turned their back on him. How many people would walk away from their religion and say, I'm out of here, if you get this? He didn't. He was loyal to Hashem. He cried out. He said, HaKosh Baruch, I don't understand why. It's, it's so dark. I pray to you. I know you answered my ancestors, but it's so dark. Did you ever feel that you're praying to God, but you're not sure if he's listening to you? Do you ever feel really alone in the world and wonder if God is paying attention to you? You are created in the image of Hashem. He loves you very much. That's the Haftar on its own. Isaiah 55. Seek Hashem when you call out to Him because if the person who sins turns back, I will freely forgive him. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. David HaMelech trusted in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, despite the fact that sometimes it was very dark. And that's why Mizmer Ladovid follows that Psalm 23. No matter what, even if I'm walking in the shadow of darkness, I know you're with me. Whether it's your staff or your rod, everything comforts me. It's one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. Anyways, my dear brothers, I, it's a joy to be with you here tonight. Really, it's big schos, big honor. And instead of me speaking, what I'd like to do is turn this over to you, my dear brothers. And if you have any questions, this is the time for you. You're welcome to ask a question on any topic you'd like. Yes? How did you get into this kind of work? How did I ever get into a work like this? 16 years old, Moitzi Shabbos, Saturday night. My family went out in New York City to a restaurant. I don't think it exists anymore. I think it's called Moshe P. King. And on the way back to the car in Midtown Manhattan, I think it was on Fifth Avenue, I saw three people. They were pasting up posters on the lampposts. I was a very curious kid. And I read what it said. It said, come this Tuesday night to Jews for Jesus and learn more about your Jewish Messiah. What? What? I was just like a bomb went off. What? Jews for what? You're going to do what? You understand, I was born 15 years after the Holocaust. People who were born somewhere in the realm of when I was born, remember when we were kids, it was a common thing to see people with numbers on their arms. Today, not so many. And I knew exactly who did it to them who did it to us, who nearly wiped out my entire family in the spring of 1940, in the spring of 1944. It was Christians. There was no Holocaust in any Buddhist countries. Jews for what? And I began to argue with them. And it was not a very satisfying conversation. It was a conversation going absolutely nowhere too quickly. In, in Mittendrin, and in the middle of this, I don't know who he is, a fellow walked over to me, an elderly Jew. He saw what was going on. He pulled me, let me away from them. And he said, stop arguing with these missionaries. You don't know enough. 
if you want to do something productive to fight missionaries, this is what you can do. Why don't you follow them around? And as they paste up their posters, <laughs> do you know this? You know how insulted I was? I don't know. I learned in the Mir Yeshiva. I didn't go to some Hebrew school. I was, we were learning going to Mishmer twice a week until 8 o'clock at night. I don't know enough to argue with these fellows. I'm not sure if they're Jewish. I should be relegated to pulling posters down. This is, should be my whole, my whole career, all this learning, and I could pull posters down. I was just so appalled. I was so... The following... It was a fall. I visited Eretz Shal for the first time in my life. My uncle, Uncle Meir, Zechrein Levrachu, lived in the Jewish quarter of the old city on number 34, Misgav Ladach. When I came to his house... First time I was ever in the Holy Land. Um, my uncle, I, we were very excited. We were staying there, Mamish, in the middle of the Jewish quarter. And he, and he told me that the prayer Shabbos, before I arrived, he had a galach, he had a minister at his home as a guest. He somehow got into a big conversation with him at a bookstore, invited him, the minister agreed. And when that minister left my uncle's home, he gave him a present, he gave him a gift. What present did he give my uncle? He gave him a... Exactly, a King James Bible. <laughs> and he showed it to me, give a look at what I have. Like he had the manual from the other team. Give a look at what we got here. And I told him, that's what I want to read. And I began to study it. So from his roof, you could see the top of the hotel. That was very interesting. I never, I only, so I ran down to, to Davin. Every time I Davin, people ask, where do you Davin? The old say, well, where am I going to Davin? I'm Davin? Of course I'm going to Davin there. I was praying at the Western Wall, and as I'm davening, and the first time, it's really a very powerful experience, first time I'm praying there, I feel a tap on my shoulder. Who's tapping in the middle of davening? I turn around, there's a fellow sitting in front of me with a yarmulke on, the cardboard yarmulke, the one they give out for free when you go down the ramp. And he asked me, he said, excuse me, do you know the Lord? Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm standing here. <laughs> I was, well, so I said, of course I do. And he looked at me, he said, you mean you know who Yeshua is? I said, of course I do. I went to Yeshiva with him. He was in my class. <laughs> I was thinking of Yeshua Jacobowitz. I had no idea what this man was talking about. We began to talk, and I quickly began to find out, find out what this man was talking about. And we, I blew my whole vacation on. We studied in, is, in Israel together. We both came back to New York, continued to study together. And then, yeah, young men did tshuva. When that happened, it just, I knew, look, I never heard a voice. I never saw a vision. <laughs> but I'm as sure as someone could be that HaKosh Baruch Hu put me on this earth, that I was born for the purpose of bringing Jews out of the church. That's the purpose. And bring the gula, because that must happen. The church has to go down. Must. Asa has to be finished. Maybe 15 years ago, I didn't gedenk I was in Muncie. They used to have a path mark in Muncie. On the major road, what is that, Road 59, right? It's the big room. So I did my shopping, had my cart, it was full, and now I was at the cashier, by the, and you take your stuff out of the cart, and you put it on the belt where it moves. So I had a big shopping, wagon, and I'm taking stuff out. And there's a f gentleman behind me who's a chashivayid with a burden, pays, and he starts taking things out of my cart and putting it on the belt. And I felt bad. This is a hush of a Jew here. I said, you don't need to do this. He said, Rabbi Singer. His voice sounded familiar. You don't recognize me? Take a look at me. was that fellow, the Rashivan Munsi. 
They're coming home, my friends. They're coming home. That's how it started. It was that trigger. Very important. You open the Messiah's Hashem, it tells you, you have to know why you're here, what your purpose is, and follow it. You'll receive a calling. It may not be the calling I heard, but when you do, follow it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you unique gifts, a unique chush that makes you very, very special in the world. Use those gifts for holy things. Whatever it is, whatever your calling is, devote your life to it. Use that to bring about the gula. Use that to spread the light. And sometimes spreading light means removing the darkness. Why are the missionaries so active now? Why are missionaries so active now? Because there are, first of all, there are certain things in Tanakh that are prophesied that were supposed to happen before Mashiach comes. I mean, most importantly, that Jews would return to Eretz Israel before Mashiach comes. These Christians believe that the Jewish return to Eretz Israel and Yerushalayim is a film of the prophecy. They're correct about that. Just wrong about everything else. So they believe that trigger occurred and now the Jews have to be converted to Christianity in order to allow a second coming. There's no such thing as a second coming. A second coming is a complete invention of the church. Why do you need a second coming? Because he didn't do anything in the first coming. If you do nothing in the first coming, you need a second coming. Ah, the second coming, nothing, a third coming. It doesn't make a difference. This is an invention. If for any failed mess messianic movement, you need second comings. What do you need a second coming for? Because nothing happened in the first coming, right? There are people still today, Ada Yemizet in Turkey. They still believe in Shab Tzvi. I'm not kidding. There's a whole movement of them. And they believe second coming. All the false messiahs, when their beliefs are disconfirmed, they go second coming. But based on a verse in the Christian Bible, Matthew 23, verse 39, so they believe that in order for Yashka to make a second coming, the Jews have to en masse be converted to Christianity. In 1972, evangelical fundamentalist Christians gathered in Western Switzerland. It's a cabal. It's called the Lausanne Conference on Jewish Evangelism. You can read the minutes. And they wanted to understand Herzog zu In 1972, that's five years after the 67 war, Yishlaim was in the hands of the Jews for five years. It was there for 19 years, there was no Jew allowed into to the old city of Yishlaim. Here, it was not a problem. There it was. Imagine that. So the, the Jews have returned. So they gather in, in one of the oldest, it's actually one of the oldest Jewish communities in all of Europe. They wanted to understand why had the church failed until that point in their effort to convert the Jews to Christianity and what new techniques could be used to finally convert the Jews. They also gathered in Thailand. And they put you under a microscope. They want to understand how your brain works. They want to figure out why is it that Christianity spread through Europe in the blink of an eye, South America becomes Christian. Brazil becomes the largest Roman Catholic country in the world. Europe, they welcome it. Mexico, they welcome it. The Jews, with all their problems, a complicated thing to be a Jew, the Jews, they can't convert. Yeah, they get one Jew here, one Mishumit here, one failure here, but it's very rare. It happens, but it's unusual. Why? And it's 72. So number one, is, it was five years after Yishlaim was liberated. And the second thing is that they believed at the time, you're too young, but you'll remember this, and so will you. At the time, the Christians believed that Jesus was going to make a second coming by the year 2000. That was the biggest thing. 2000. Whoops. <laughs> Didn't go so good. Anyways, the, at that time, they thought, 2000, that's a little more than a quarter of a century away. We've got to do something to, how much time do we have left? So they realized that the church had two problems in converting Jews. Number one, they discovered that the church had a public relations problem with Jews. <laughs> There's such illusion. How did they figure that out? What kind of public relations problem do they have with Jews? Gather around, boys. We'll explain to you. The problem they had was that Jewish people, for some reason, tend to equate Christianity with persecution. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish, 
Their mom is geniuses there. Their mom is, must have been drinking Starbucks day and night to come and figure that out. There's some reason, I don't know why, Jews, when they see, when they hear words like Jesus Christ, they don't go, ah, what am I going to hear those words? Say it again, I want to get more nachas. <laughs> Most Jews, they hear it once, they want to jump out the windows early enough. Here in their show, you really see it a lot. In America, not so much. Even in America, if you have a priest, you're only just a white collar. But here, you walk around the old silly city, you see people who are all dressed up with all kinds of outfits on, with shmatas and helmets and, and chandeliers hanging with black robe, with <laughs> shmatas and flying and big things pointing this way and that way. Look, I mean, these, these outfits were not designed by Versace. I mean, <laughs> and when we see them, they're walking through with the galochim, with all the nuns, and we see them, what do we do? Oh yeah, brach, give a look what's going on there, right? It, it's a little uncomfortable, it's a little unpleasant. If we see a fellow who's a Buddhist, is a Hare Krishna with, with, with orange pajamas walking around. So we say, nebuch, that poor mother, right? <laughs> but we don't have that visceral reaction to we see Galachim running through the old city with their whole entourage. It bothers us. Why does it bother us so much? It bothers us because for 2,000 years they've been persecuting us. They all hated us. They all did. All the church fathers despised Jews. There was no nice church father. There was no friendly. They all hated us, despised us. And they expressed it. And they all said the Jews are going to, Jewish, that's where Yishlaim has to be destroyed. They wanted the Harbais to be destroyed. To them, a Harbais had nothing on it. it was a simon, was a symbolized that the Jews will never, ever return to Israel. Never. Yishlaim stood as a, at sea and a monument to what happens to people that kills God. When, when Rome, when the first emperor of Rome converted to Christianity, he convened the Council of Nicaea in 325. Constantine, convened the Council in 325 to decide what is it that Christians believe. Exactly. I'm going to go into the details. If you'll ask me, I'll explain it. And as soon as the church accepted that Yoshka was God, imagine such a sick thing. And, and you know what they also did at this council called the Council of Nicaea? They rejected Torah Shabbat Peh. What did they do? They rejected the Jewish calendar. Until that point, Easter used to be dated based on Pesach. When the Jews said it was Pesach, that's when the Christians celebrate Easter. But our entire calendar, Jewish calendar, is complete Torah Shabbat Peh. Completely, because we have to intercalate a month every once in a while, we have to add an extra other sometimes. Why? Because the lunar year is 354 days and the solar year is 365 and a quarter years. And the problem is, so what? So we'll just do it like the Muslims do it. There's a problem. There's a Pusik in the Torah. Where? In the Sefer Devarim, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verse 1, tells us Pesach has to come out in the springtime. It's not possible. So you have to add in. How do you add in? We have it from Moshe Rabbeinu, Halacha Mishin, Halacha, Halacha Moshe Mishinai, whatever it is, but we had a calculation, it's a Gemara and Rosh Hashanah, and how the exact length of a synodic month. We had it and the Christians relied on us. Or they had to rely on Adim. But they had to rely on the Jews. And this they could not accommodate. The Jews who killed God, the enemies of God, we're going to be semich on them on when we're going to celebrate Easter? Down with that. We're going to do it based on, on the vernal equinox, something completely different. Do you know what happened to the Jews in Yerushalayim immediately after? All expelled. Every Jew was thrown out of Yerushalayim in 326. Every Jew. Except to mock us once a year on Tishbav, they would if we paid a knas, if we paid a fine, a bribe, they would allow us on Tishbav to mock us to let us come into Shrine to pray. And then we had to leave. And for 35 years that's how it remained. No Jew in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was Jew free. Jew free, no Jews allowed. How much no Jews allowed? Until there was an emperor, his name is Julian. In 361, he, he was raised a Christian, but he left Christianity and became reverted back to the paganism of the Roman Empire. 
So he rejected Christianity. If he rejected Christianity, then he's not so anti-Jewish. He said, okay, come back. <laughs> but he only was an emperor for three years. And once it was Julian, he's called the apostate by the going because he was an apostate against Christianity. Once he was out, the Christians were back in, Jews out again. When you go through the old city and you see the, the cardo of those pillars prominently as you walk down the stairs from Chabad Street, that street is Byzantine Empire. Those pillars, no Jew allowed to walk there. No Jew allowed to walk there. Never. So. Do you know this? What's that? Do you know this? No, I'm talking during the Byzantine Empire. During the Byzantine Empire. Now you can walk there all you want. In fact, not only could you walk there, but little boys and girls, they have a game they play. So the top of the pillars, next time you go, look carefully, you'll see there are little pebbles, little pebbles on top of the pillars. What are the little pebbles doing there? It's a Pasuk of the Navi. Which Navi? Zechariah. Ah, what a holy man he was. So Zechariah says there'll be a day is coming, this is Zechariah chapter 8, that little children will play in the streets of Yerushalayim. Old men and old women will walk with their canes in Yerushalayim. Imagine that. What happens? The Byzantine Empire is finished. Goodbye. The Roman Empire is finished. And we're back. And we're now going to play in Yerushalayim. So little boys and girls have a game. They could throw a pebble up and see if it can land on the top of the pillar. We're back and you're gone. You want to know about the Byzantine Empire? You want to be to read about the Romans? Indred, go to a library, take out a very old book, blow off the dust, and there you'll read about them. They're finished. And the the God of Israel, never lies. Lo yishaker. V'gam netzach Yisrael lo yishaker, ki lo yodem hu li nochem. Remember that, the glory of Israel never lies. Ki lo yodem hu, because he's not a man, that he will change his mind. So the church understood that it had to change things. The Jews had, did not have a favorable view of the church. So they developed this technique. You're Jewish? Are you Jewish? We love you. Baruch Hashim. <laughs> we love the Jews. That was the first approach. Approach number two is that Jews, they realize, don't want to convert to Christianity because Jews recognize correctly that if they convert to Christianity, they cease to be Jewish. That's where the second technique has come in. The second te technique goes like this. When you become a believer in Jesus, you're not converting to another religion. Oh, no. You're becoming a Messianic Jew, a complete Jew, a full Jew. It's the most Jewish thing you can do. Jesus was a Jew. How can it not be Jewish to believe in Jesus? Okay? So those were the techniques that were developed that has been shockingly successful. Mm -hmm.